um, the first part of that cycle, the glyphosate and the citric acid cycle last time. This time you're going to talk about the bulk of energy production that happens inside the mitochondria and chloroplast in the form of electron transfer chain. That's going to be our main uh, topic for today. Okay, so uh, what are the main parts that we will focus on? Uh, we're going to focus a lot on mitochondria and oxidative phosphorylation and the molecular mechanism of electron transport chain, the different parts of that electron transport chain, the three main enzymes that are part of it, leading up to ATP synthase, which is where most of the ATP is produced. We are also going to be talking about chloroplast and photosynthesis and how that uh, compares with this mitochondrial phosphorylation system as well. And then at the end, uh, we may get to talk about evolution of energy generating systems. So obviously, you've been talking about this already for a week or two, um, that we need energy in order to survive. And in order to get that energy, we usually either utilize um, inorganic substances or organic substances that we consume to get that energy from those sources. Um, Electron transport chain is one of the main ways that organisms get ATP generation. This first appeared in bacteria about 3 billion years ago. So looking at the, the system, it is a membrane bound system to generate ATP. Um, and so you have your energy from food that you're taking in and you're going to be putting it into the system. You're gonna break down those foods into smaller molecules that can be utilized for energy. Then you convert them to activated molecules like those NADH, FADH, um, and all that good stuff. And then you go through a series of oxidative phosphorylation steps where you take the electrons from those uh, systems, those activated molecules, to um, go through the membranes in a series of steps uh, to create uh, energy. On the other end, in plants, you have a little bit different where they cannot just take energy from food. They first has to make the food. And in that case as well, they're going to be taking energy from sunlight and use a very similar electron transfer pump system uh, where they're again, pumping protons across the membranes to get that energy production. Chat, I should open up the chat. Yes, yeah, so there's no lab this week, right? Uh, the next lab you're gonna have is gonna be after Thanksgiving and that's gonna be to prepare our posters. Um, I have the video that walks you through basically what I'll do that lab um, already posted in there as well in the assignment. So you could look at it and see how to prepare a template and start working on it if you wanted to work ahead. Um, but that's what you're going to be working on. And then the last lab is going to be our presentation or like our little poster session. Um, there is a little change that I am having you guys post a video presentation as well for the grading purposes in case um, there is some issue that I cannot do the full length uh, poster session where I get come to each group and have you guys present at that time. I will still do Q&A in person uh, that day regardless. Okay, um, so let's look at first mitochondrial energy production. Um, and so we are going to be looking at uh, that electron transfer chain. And so uh, a lot of that is going to be through use of proton gradients. So you're using these hydrogen ions, these positively charged ions to create a proton gradient. And that is what's going to be used to transfer those high energy electrons from one place to another, right? Because you need that uh, transfer uh, to happen. So in the first stage, the energy of the electron transport uh, is going to be used. First, you have to input some energy anytime you have to get started to pump these protons across the membranes. You take those high energy electrons from those activated molecules um, and convert them to lower energy electrons as you go through those proton pumps. And then all these protons that are released as the process as you know, with these transfers of electrons are then utilized by this ADP synthase to create ATP from ADP and phosphorylation. So the energy in these protons is harnessed by ADP synthase to make ATP. Um, so it's a little bit like a battery, right? That works. Um, cells essentially are harnessing the energy from those electrons and they are converting them 
um, not just to heat energy, right? Because if you're just having them in a single loop of transfer where you just take the electrons and transfer them to the other side, um, uh, you are going to lose a lot of the energy to heat energy. However, what they are doing is they are using it in a very controlled way so that they can harness some of that energy for their own work and then lose less of it to heat itself and store the rest of it for their own utilization. Um, so this is a, a coupled process, right? Chemiosmotic coupling is part of this process because our cells without the help of mitochondria cannot do this. And mitochondria, we've talked about the endosymbiotic theory before, how at some point there were these bacteria and they were able to um, you know, have the symbiotic relationship inside these eukaryotic cells where they were able to provide this energy. And now it's over time, both chloroplast and mitochondria have become an integral part of the eukaryotic system. They have their own little, uh, they have their own membranes, they have their own DNA, right? They have a lot of those systems already present, still preserved to this day. Their genes uh, that are, there are certain genes that are only present within those genomes that are not going to be part of our own DNA. So if you look at these two structures, the mitochondria and chloroplast, you'll see some similarities. You'll see those DNA. Those are circular, kind of like our bacterial DNA. And then they have those membranes, the inner and outer membranes in both cases. And in both cases, they have something which is an inner membrane space or a, a third space that is composed of a different structural membrane. In this case, that's the matrix. In chloroplast, it's your thylakoid membranes that are where the site for those energy productions. Okay, so I have to talk about this. So mitochondria um, are usually, you know, obviously because they're making the energy, it makes sense that they would be housed more close to the places that they are needed um, where you have really high ATP utilization. So for example, in a cardiac muscle, they're going to be uh, housed close to the contractile organelles or contractile spaces so they can provide ready available energy right at the source. Similarly, in a sperm's tail, you would see these long tubes essentially just merge mitochondria all around the flagella um, to provide that uh, area, that dynamic structure, the energy it needs in order to propel forward at a very efficient manner. So they no, don't just stack next to each other. They can get fused together as well and create a very elongated structure. Um, and this is one in a cell, in a eukaryotic cell. And you see all those mitochondria kind of fusing together to create longer structures, more like factories. Um, here, another one, uh, you can see those mitochondria completely kind of compiled together. And that actually is super cool property of it, where they can make these little powerhouses or uh, electric factories to create lots and lots of ATP in those areas. When we look inside the mitochondria, there are four separate compartments that you guys should know about. So you should know about obviously the uh, mitochondrial matrix, which is the inner core of the mitochondria. This is where you will have lots of those enzymes that are required um, for the oxidation of pyruvates, but also for your um, the citric acid cycle. Uh, then you have the two membranes on the outside. You have the outer and the inner membrane. These, um, the outer membrane is a single layer, right? That's creating that outside structure. It contains uh, its own kind of, you know, just like our nuclear uh, proteins, the membrane is very particular. It has the pore complexes. It has very particular structures and proteins embedded within it. Similarly, our outer membrane of the mitochondria also has specific protein biology to it. Um, there are these large proteins that form channel-like structures in there called porins um, that make it permeable to different types of molecules than what our outer membrane and nuclear membranes are permeable to. So this one is permeable to all molecules. It's not just permeable to specific molecules as long as they are 5,000 thousands or less. So there is a certain group of molecules that may not be permeable to nuclei or to the outer membrane, but will be permeable to these because of the presence of those porins. So uh, the inside membrane, the inner membrane, is going to be not just a single membrane, but it rather folds into itself to create that intermembrane space, the site of our electron transport chain. 
Um, this is where all our oxidative phosphorylation uh, takes place and that ATP production happens. Um, questions about this before I move forward? So you should know the difference between each of the spaces and what they are utilized for. Okay, so for um, obviously the oxidative phosphorylation that requires oxygen, right? In its name, it uh, says it as well. Um, you need the prerequisite of it, that is that your polysaccharides and fats and uh, all the other stuff has been already broken down into appropriate sources. So polysaccharides are broken down to sugars, fats into fatty acids, and those fatty acids can then be metabolized inside the mitochondria uh, to get your acetyl-CoA molecules. And then our sugars obviously are then taken into the cytoplasm as glucose uh, that are then broken down to paraweights. And those paraweights are then taken into the mitochondria to create the acetyl-CoA and go into the citric acid cycle. So looking inside the uh, mitochondria, this first part glycolysis has taken place outside in the cytoplasm. And now you have your pyruvates that are coming in into the acetyl, converting into the acetyl-CoA cycle, going into the citric acid. Um, this portion is not oxidative phosphorylation, right? This is still enzyme linked. Here, the second part, once you have those NADH, FADH, all those different um, to activated molecules available, those are the ones that are going into the inner membrane space. And those are the ones that are going to be part of the oxidative phosphorylation in the form of electron transport chain and then ADP synthesis. So I'm showing you example with NADH. FADH will do the same thing. So your NADH and FADH that have been produced through your first few steps through glycolysis and a citric acid cycle are going to be um, used here. They have those two high energy electrons from the sugar phosphidation, uh, you know, oxidation. Those electrons are what are going to be passed into that inner membrane space. That's where the electron transport chain starts. Um, and that electron uh, donation is going to then release two electrons. Um, it will take those two electrons and take them into the membrane and as a result, release the two protons outside the membrane space. So the bond rearrangement is gonna leave you, leave you behind with the NAD plus uh, from that uh, initial NADH and the protons are gonna go out of the membrane, um, that inner membrane and uh, the two electrons are gonna get passed to the next molecule in the, in the chain. So there are three different molecules that we will look at in that inner membrane space that these uh, electrons will move through as they go through the electron transport chain. Uh, so you're getting those NADH that are going into that first molecule, um, getting rid of protons. And then as they move through those three different enzymes, uh, or you are going to see similar uh, protons getting released that are all going to be utilized by the last enzyme, which is the ATP synthase to create um, the ATP. So these high energy electrons are basically powering, they are the ones that are starting the energy process. They're starting this uh, pump essentially from working it into work and creating the ATP synthase. Um, and this is an example of that again, where you have those NADH giving in those um, electrons and then they are going to be passing through those three enzymes, um, leaving protons in that inner membrane space. Those protons are gonna charge ADP synthase and create ATP from ADP and phosphates that are coming in. Also, this process will require oxygen as the final acceptor for these electrons. And when that happens, they are going to be converting uh, in, into water molecules. <clears throat> so energy in the form of NADH uh, will combine with um, protons and oxygen to produce NAD plus and water. And on the other end of the cycle, you will have ADP and phosphates coming in, powered by the system to create ADP. So looking at it closer, um, these are the three enzymes that you, again, should know about. The first one is the NADH dehydrogenase complex. It does exactly what it says. It takes NADH, 
takes strips those two protons from it, right? Those type two hydrogens from it, throws them out, take the electrons and pass them over. The next one is the cytochrome C reductase complex, which is going to take the electrons that are coming in from this first enzyme through ubiquinone, and that ubiquinone is going to go into the cytochrome C reductase complex, and then as a result, will release cytochrome C um, and protons again into the intermembrane space. Cytochrome C is going to be the uh, molecule that will go into the third enzyme, which is cytochrome C oxidase complex, which is going to take, um, which is going to utilize the oxygen and the protons to create water. So these three enzymes all have very distinct functions throughout this process, with the final function being that all of them are going to, you know, the same function for all of them is that all of them are going to be releasing protons and transferring those electrons from one place to another. And then each one of them is going to do it in its own unique way to also produce something else as a result as their reactants. So the quinones, uh, the ubiquinone um, in our ubiquinone in the intermembrane space in that membrane are um, especially made to stay there. They have a very hydrophobic, very long tail, and that hydrocarbon tail preserves it in that membrane. It can't get out because that's the way it has to be because it's very hydrophobic. It's going to remain in that membrane space. Um, these quinones carry, all they do is they carry electrons within the lipid layer. So they take them from that NADH reductase, uh, dehydrogenase, and they move it into the next molecule. Um, and they do that by, you know, uh, taking those electrons again and uh, becoming into reduced ubiquinone. Once they have transferred theirs to the cytochrome C, cytochrome C itself can bind to many, many different um, compounds uh, because of the structure that it has. And uh, one of the structure that it combines with is heme. Um, which contains obviously you know your iron in there but it is going to use that it is a very versatile electron carrier uh, these metals that can bind to it because of its structure um, can make it more available for a lot of different molecules to utilize to react with and that helps in its other functions as well so protons are basically what are getting readily accepted and donated throughout this process so anytime you have an oxidized electron carrier, you're going to have a transient intermediate uh, molecule where you are taking in electrons and then um, taking protons from the water to create a reduced electron carrier. And anytime you have a reduced electron carrier, you're going to be giving off the electrons um, and creating a transient intermediate so that you can give off that proton to water to create an oxidized electron carrier. So throughout the electron transport chain, two things that you need are oxygen and water because they are going to be helping this process along. Any questions, guys? The chat walked away for a second. Where is it? Okay, I got it. Any questions? So the last one is your cytochrome C oxidase, which is going to be the one that's utilizing the molecular oxygen and reducing it. Um, that one is, uh, again, because of the structure of the cytochrome C and its ability to bind to different metal ions, it uh, use, uh, you know, heme and copper atoms are going to be part of that active site. In this um, cytochrome C oxidase molecule, the uh, actual uh, molecule in the membrane, the enzyme, and the cytochrome C is going to transfer those electrons to those metal uh, spaces, to those active sites. So heme, as well as the copper that is a part of this cytochrome C oxidase um, enzyme are going to help with that electron transfer. This is made up of multiple subunits. You just need to know the names, not how many subunits are there. And you just need to know that they bind to these heme and copper atoms to form the active site. 
Um, and obviously, again, it's going to keep moving the protons along into that intermembrane space as well. So this particular uh, unit will take four electrons from the incoming stratocrome seeds and combine them with four protons and oxygen to make water molecules. This is the last enzyme in the chain of three. So as they're doing this, there is going to be obviously an electrochemical proton gradient being established across the inner mitre kind of membrane where, you know, for each one of your steps, you're going to be moving these protons into the intermembrane space. So now you have a lot of these protons hanging out in that intermembrane space um, and not a lot in the matrix, right? So your pH out here is lowered because of that compared to the inner matrix area. And the inner mitochondrial membrane is going to be that negatively charged compared to the outside, because obviously that's where all the protons are and all the electrons are hanging out in there. So there is an electrochemical proton gradient as well um, happening uh, because of that. And there is also a pH gradient because of that, right? So you have the electrochemical gradient as well as uh, the pH gradient that and both are helpful in this process. And the orientation of your membrane obviously matters because of that, right? Because your electrons that are coming in are going to directly channel the protons to the outer space. So here you see again, the example of those three carriers. You have your first one, uh, which is the NADH dehydrogenase. That's gonna take in the electrons. It's going to strip them off of it, leaving protons outside and then go to the next step. Um, so who is actually pumping these protons are proton pumps, which are all along that intermembrane uh, matrix membrane, that membrane between those two. Those are going to be normally in a closed conformation. But when the electron transfer happens, um, that opens the conformation, taking the protons from the inner mem uh, from the inside of the matrix and putting them outside into the outer space. So again, as each step happens, you're going to get more and more protons out, even though you have already a lot of protons on the outside, they will continue to go out because of the electrons getting transferred from one enzyme to another, creating that uh, gradient so that it can continuously shuttle uh, these protons into the outer space. Outside in that space, as they get pulled together, they will be recruited by ATP synthase. That is going to keep bringing them in to create ATP, keeping that electrochemical gradient going so that you can still continuously pump these electrons and move uh, them forward in that direction. If this wasn't working, you would stop the electron transport chain because all the protons would be on the outside and the electrochemical gradient would not be maintained. But because the ATP synthase is charged at that, by those abundance of protons and they keep recruiting them in to create ATP, you keep that electrochemical gradient moving in that space. Um, the way that works is that those protons are recruited into this uh, ATP synthase. Uh, and this is the way it runs. And as they do, it rotates this upper structure. So that structure is going to rotate uh, and that rotation is going to lead to synthesis of ATP. I think I had a video of it, which was really cool. I hope it's still, that link is not broken. I really like the little shader. I really like this one to get open and that is here. It works like a turbine to convert the energy stored in the proton baby into chemical energy stored in the body of the baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are the protons that are coming in that are, at, you know, essentially fueling this rotation. Drives a rotor that lies in the membrane. It is thought the protons flow through an entry open to one side of the membrane and bind to rotor subunits. Only protonated subunits can then rotate into the membrane, away from the static channel assembly. Once the protonated subunits have completed an almost full circle and have returned to the static subunits, 
and exit channel allows them to reach the other side of the membrane. In this way, the energy stored in the proton radius is converted into mechanical rotational energy. The rotational energy is transmitted via a shaft attached to the rotor that penetrates deep into the center of the characteristic lollipop head, the F1 ATPase, which catalyzes the formation of ATP. The F1 ATPase portion of ATP synthase has been crystallized. You can have cool. That can be so cool the way it works. Its molecular structure shows that the position of the central shaft influences the conformation and arrangement of the surrounding substance. It is these changes that drive the synthesis of ATP from ADP. In this animated model, different conformational states are lined up as a temporal sequence as they would occur during rotation of the central shaft. Like any enzyme, ATP synthase can work in either direction. If the concentration of ATP is high and the proton gradient low, ATP synthase will run in reverse, hydrolyzing ATP as it pumps protons across the membrane. To show the rotation of the central shaft, a short fluorescent actin filament was experimentally attached to it. Single filaments attached to single F1 ATP aces can be visualized in the microscope. When ATP is added, the filament starts spinning, directly demonstrating the mechanical properties of this remarkable molecular machine. Okay, so um, these are some of the portions that you were uh, you should know about from the structure. You should know about the rotating head uh, that it's again a multi-unit complex. It has several uh, uh, several subunits of the protein combined together to create that rotation. Uh, each one has an active site for binding of these protons that recruits these protons that causes it to go into the membrane or rotate into the membrane. Um, you should know about the stator that helps to keep the system moving in the direction that it is moving at that time. The rotor can go in either direction um, and that's how it can synthesize or hydrolyze uh, your ATP, depending on what the needs are. So if there are no electron transfers coming in, there's not enough energy in the system, there are no, not enough protons on the outside, it would actually take ATP within the system to go in reverse so that it can have protons in the outer membrane. So here you have the various parts of that structure in a more 3D Form. So it's not a single protein, as I said, it's a bunch of different proteins that are coming together to create this ATP synthase uh, in its fully working form. Some of those protein uh, structures are going to be embedded within the membrane. So the rotor ring that carries the protons are membrane embedded. And then there are other portions of the stator that are um, membrane embedded, as well as some that are going to be uh, conversing with that ADPase head that is going to be creating the ATP in that site. And then there is a central shaft that combines those two together and rotates. So the electron transfer releases a very large amount of energy. That's where most of the energy from those molecules are released. Uh, again, just to remind you and to show how that uh, process goes and how that redox potential. So this is telling you how much energy was stored in those electrons at the first point. At each point, you are losing some of that energy and taking, transferring the rest to the next molecule. 
So each time those electrons are slightly less uh, energy uh, producers and then eventually leading to that uh, water molecule release. So the NADH, that is the first activated molecule. That's the most energy containing molecule in this structure, in this uh, equation. It's gonna go through the NADH dehydrogenase complex and then transfer those electrons to the ubiquinone. That ubiquinone is gonna have a lot lower uh, potential than the NADH did. Um, those ubiquinone will then go into cytochrome C reductase complex to convert it from ubiquinone to cytochrome C. Um, and that cytochrome C is then going to go into cytochrome C oxidase complex to utilize oxygen and release water. And all it is going to produce 26.2 kilocals per mole uh, per electron. So that's about 52.4 kilocals per mole for each of the NADH molecules that you have. Um, this is driven, uh, again, through coupled uh, change, right? So you have all these processes happening coupled to each other to make them move forward because some of them are extremely energy producing and others are not as energy producing. So this process wouldn't happen unless you had pyruvates coming in, going into the citric acid cycle, doing all that stuff, right? So in the beginning, you know, you have the pH gradient driven through the power weight inward into the mitochondria. And then on the other end, you have the voltage gradient driving the ADP to ATP exchange that's driven by those proton pumps. And then um, your ATP synthase is going to be maintaining that gradient. Uh, And finally, the pH gradient is also going to be driving the phosphate import because it, without it, you wouldn't be able to take in the phosphates just like you wouldn't be able to take in the protons either. So, oh, chat question. Yes, there is a limit to how many uh, molecules can bind to the rotor heads. There are only so many spaces in there. I believe there are seven. Uh, but I will confirm. So that's as many protons that it can take at a time. Okay, so in glycolysis, you had um, first started the process by taking in two ATP molecules. And then as a result, you had produced a net yield of two, uh, two ATP at the end when you got the pyruvates. In pyruvate oxidation to acetyl-CoA, you didn't get an ADP, but you did get some NADH molecules that were transferred into the mitochondrial matrix. In your exudation in the citric acid cycle, you got further production of NADH. So you had six NADH, two FADH2, and two GTPs. All of those were products from your complete oxidation. Um, in the citric acid cycle and beyond. So the total amount of ATP, and you'll see this number will be different in different places, but overall, what you need to know is that majority of your ATP is getting produced at the end of the day in this oxidative phosphorylation stage in electron transport chain. So, you know, everything else before that is gonna just give you a minuscule amount of energy compared to what you can get from oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. If you uncouple these agents, if you can couple the different parts, if you only had, for example, the electron transport chain and you had some kind of, um, you know, uh, let's say a pore or some kind of uh, enzyme that was in the other side that was shuffling these protons out so that they could not be used by ADP synthase, you would just inhibit the entire process and you would not get any more ADP production at all. So they have been experiments that showed very clearly that this proton gradient is what transfers the energy to produce ATP production, to fuel ATP production. Uh, many of these were done, again, in bacterial, uh, in bacterial oil systems or in field vesicles or liposomes, where you're essentially making an artificial cell-like membrane and you can put just what you want in there. So in this particular, this is essentially an in vitro experiment without any living system, so to speak. All they had were these lipid bilayers, a liposome with one protein, bacterial rhodopsin. This is a proton pump. That's it. And they 
but um, you know, uh, allowed it to take the energy from light and it was able to shovel protons into the space, but there was no energy production. Then they had another liposome where they had just the ATP synthase, no bacteriorhodopsin, and they exposed it to light and there was no ATP generation, even though they had all the components inside. The only times ADP was generated was if you had both ATP synthase and the proton pumps present in those liposomes. Then, and only then, were you able to get ATP. If you added an uncoupling agent or another uh, you know, receptor or another channel that was able to take those protons out before it could um, run the ATP synthase, then there was, again, no ATP generation. So this these two together is important. They have to be coupled in order for ATP to be, to be produced. Okay, so next we're going to be looking at chloroplasts and photosynthesis. Was checking for time. Moving good on time. So, um, in this part, we are going to look at the process of photosynthesis, which is obviously how we take organic material uh, and or produce all organic material at the end of the day. Uh, photosynthesis is a series of light-driven reactions to create organic molecules using these uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then water uh, molecules are utilized uh, to split to produce oxygen as a result as well. Photosynthesis is going to generate and then consume ATP and NADPH. So that is a way for it to first make its food and then utilize the energy through respiration, which is gonna be similar to what we just went through um, right now. The initially when photosynthesis started in bacteria through photosynthetic bacteria, that's what filled our atmosphere with oxygen and enabled um, all the aerobic metabolism that allows ADP to be used as our main energy source. So looking at chloroplasts, just like mitochondria, we talked about it, it has very specialized membrane. Each membrane is a little bit different. Each part of it is a little bit different in its composition and the work that it can perform. Um, so here you have the chloroplasts inside your uh, cell. Looking at one of these in um, detail, you will see it has these chlorophyll containing thylakoid membranes that are stacked on top of each other. And then you have, again, an inner and an outer membrane as well. And that's important for, again, its functioning because each part of those membranes is going to have very different biology and different enzymes associated with it. These hyalocoid membranes, these stacks are your granas that are stacked on top of each other, um, and they make these structures called your hyalocoid membranes. Um, so the photosynthetic electron transfer reactions happen in these hyalocoid membranes, these granas that are stacked in here um, in two different stages. Stage one is what we call light reactions, and stage two is what we call light independent reactions. So in that first stage, you require sunlight to store the energy that is then going to be utilized um, to in the form of ATP and NADPH to create your organic material like sugars and amino acids and fatty acids and all that good stuff. In the light reactions, they require also input of water. And in your light independent reactions, which are your carbon fixation cycle in the second half, you require input of carbon dioxide. So there are two very distinct stages of this process that are happening there. Light in here is essentially going to behave like our protons uh, or that you know, all those protons that were being generated and utilized uh, in the mitochondrial membranes. So all uh, the light that is coming in is essentially uh, going to be a stream of particles called photons. It's going to have some packets of energy, right? It will provide it some energy because of that. Um, 
how much energy it stores is direct, inversely proportional to the wavelength. So the shorter wavelengths are going to have higher quantum of energy than longer wavelengths. The photons are absorbed by pigments associated with whatever wavelength, whatever color of light that wavelength represents, right? And that energy is transferred to electrons and those electrons that are charged by those photons, those little packets of energy, are going to be excited and called in photo excitation stage. So sunlight is absorbed specifically by those chlorophyll molecules. Chlorophyll contain, um, again, a ring structure that is very, very similar to something else that you looked at in the electron transport chain. It is also, uh, you know, and it is, it is porphyrin. It is this ring structure and it has, again, a very hydrophobic tail region that is going to keep it in that membrane space, in that pilovite membrane space. Um, that similar to how ubiquinin had, because of its hydrophobic tail, stays in the membrane space. The light is absorbed by the electrons in this ring structure. It's stabilized by, again, metal ions, in this case, magnesium ions. Um, the chlorophyll, uh, chlorophylls is the main pigment that you see inside, obviously, our plants. And it absorbs light of both blue as well as red wavelengths. So on either side of your visible spectrum, there are areas that it is able to absorb and store, which is great, which is probably why it is one of the more abundant ones. Um, other pigments are also present at the same time in various plants in various proportions. And those other pigments will take in light of different wavelengths to us that is associated with whatever molecules they have. So here are examples of some of those pigments that are present and those spectra that they uh, will absorb. So you have your chlorophyll A and B, which are your top two, and then you have all these other ones like carotenoids and physobilin. All those other ones are going to have different wavelengths that they're absorbing. But if you combine all of them together, you see that pretty much everything is covered between them all. So they have really high absorption efficiency, uh, efficiency across the entire visible spectrum. Once you have excited your chlorophyll molecules, they are going to funnel that energy into a reaction center. Um, because these excited electrons are obviously in a charged state, they're not as stable. They would always return back to stable ground state. And they will do that by one of three methods. They can either fluoresce um, and release it as light and heat. They can do resonance transfer where they can transfer that energy to another electron nearby, or they can do an entire electron transfer like we did an electron transport chain to remove the pigment, uh, the excited electron from that pigment and carry it to a carrier molecule. So knowing the way that we um, look at these things, Obviously, you know, this is just reminding you again that pigment molecule when it is uh, charged by a photon is going to get higher energy state. Uh, this is its excited state because the electron has gotten charged and moved to a different valence, like a valence stage in a higher energy orbital. Once it loses that energy, it will fall back into its ground state, which is its normal native space. Um, Okay, so that was just a fancy repeat of my own slide because I couldn't, just, couldn't decide which way to keep. Okay, so uh, a photosystem in our uh, chlorophyll is going to actually work very much like an electron transport chain. Um, so it is going to take the electrons that are getting taken in to charge the chlorophyll molecule in one, and it is going to move it to another and then to the reaction center where you have a special pair of chlorophylls and we'll talk about what those are. So all these different uh, pigments that are present here, they are light harvesting essentially antenna complexes that can take the energy from these and charge electrons within them. And those electrons will keep moving through those systems until they reach this reaction center, which is where the react next reaction will take place. All this happens inside the thylakoid membrane. Um, the special pair transfers these electrons to an electron transport chain. 
um, where you can then utilize that energy appropriately. The photo induced charge separation that happens here. So here is your special electron, um, a special pair of chlorophyll. They will strip the electron completely off and no longer transfer to another um, of those uh, chlorophyll molecules, but rather to a mobile electron system. That mobile electron carrier will then transfer, uh, will get released into the thylakoid membrane and go to the next space. Um, the electron acceptor obviously becomes negatively charged because it has now this extra electron. And you have to replace that lost electron in order to charge the system again or reset the system again, which requires more light energy coming in. Um, so in the photosystem two, you take these electrons from those special um, chlorophyll molecules. So you have your antenna complex, lights are coming in, charging these electrons, transferring them from one place to another, going into the reaction center, where now it's also going to utilize something very similar to ubiquitinone in the thylakoid membrane, and that's plastoquinone. The plastoquinone works very similarly. It takes the electron, it moves it into a cytochrome B6 F complex. So again, similar to electron transport chain in the mitochondria, it's gonna create a proton gradient um, and release protons into the thylakoid space. These protons are going to then charge the ATP synthase just like before and create ATP. So just the molecules are a little bit different this time, but the same idea is happening. Before um, that system can take place, another thing that happens in photosystem one is generation of NADPH which also is utilizing, again, those special electrons. They are going to get car uh, carried by a carrier called ferrodoxin, which will take it to ferrodoxin NAD plus reductase and take NADP plus and convert it to NADPH. That can also fuel the photosystem too to release more protons into the outer space. This is, again, your stroma and the thylakoid space up top. So here, um, this process obviously will require some energy input in order to transfer these electrons from one place to another. And that comes through proto uh, protolysis of water. And that's going to replace those electrons in system two as well, because at the end of the day, you're just taking in all those electrons and losing them. So you need to recharge the system somehow. And so that happens through uh, in the reaction center um, where you have these electrons coming into the quinone to make that uh, space, you are also going to be taking manganese cluster in the water splitting enzyme on top, uh, utilizing the energy from light, breaking it down, releasing protons into the space, producing oxygen, and that energy that is used utilized uh, is then utilized to transfer the electrons from those special pair of chlorophylls onto the quinone. So here is the system altogether, uh, both photosystem two and one. So in photosystem two, you have the light coming in, charging your chlorophyll, transferring those uh, the energy, the electron into the photo uh, into the reaction center, where water splitting enzyme will take you know using manganese and water is going to. Uh, run the reaction to transfer the electrons into the quinone to create plastoquinone. Uh, in the process, it's going to release the protons and the oxygen by because it split the water, right? And then in the second step, the plastoquinone will take the cytochrome B6 uh, F complex, will take that and shuttle those into another molecule called plastocyanin as it, again, transports more protons out leading you to the second reaction center in photosystem one, where again, it's gonna utilize the light energy and these plastocyanin molecules and transfer again into a special chlorophyll uh, center that will transfer those uh, into a ferrodoxin, which will convert NAD plus into NADPH through ferrodoxin NAD plus reductase. All this produced protons that are, you know, accumulated into the thylakoid space, and those protons are then utilized by the ATP synthase to create ATP.
questions about that? So one of the things that I would like you to be able to do is compare and contrast the electron transport chain in a mitochondria to this electron transport chain in a chloroplast. You should be able to kind of take each part and see the similarities between the systems and what enzyme is like which enzyme um, in those two systems, which enzymes are similar. So again, coupling in this photosystems uh, boost the electrons to the higher energy level that are needed to create NADPH because just that first energy coming in from a single photon is not enough to get a full NADPH. And that's kind of like our lowest currency molecule, the FADH2, NADPH, those kind of things. So what it does is that in that first photosystem two, you are gaining energy as you go through the system. So this time you are increasing their redox potential so that that uh, plastoquinone that is coming in is higher energy than the initial photon that was that brought was brought in. And then plastoquinone will go into the second photosystem again to do the same thing where it is going to get charged further so that you are able to create the NADPH at the end and then utilize all those protons to create energy. Now, once you have that, the second part of your cycle are the uh, energy, you know, light independent reactions, which is your carbon fixation cycle. In the carbon fixation cycle, you are going to be making uh, food that can be utilized for energy essentially. And so in here you have your input are going to be your non-organics, uh, you know, your carbon dioxide and then ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate they are going to be combined to create an activated intermediate and eventually will be utilized um, to create two molecules of two phosphoglycerate uh, using water as again, an input. So you're using carbon dioxide and water to create um, three carbon sugars that are then converted into eventually your final glucose molecules. So in a carbon fixation, you're essentially using your organic molecules from CO2 and you know, carbon dioxide and water, and you're taking those in and you're utilizing that energy generated in your photosystems to create various intermediates uh, to eventually create a, a sugar molecule. Those molecules can then be utilized to create other in, uh, other organic molecules as well, like fats and amino acids. So plants are going to store carbohydrates in their chloroplasts. We've talked about those before. And they also have fat droplets inside those chloroplasts. So they are also the site of energy uh, storage. The starch granules are these large ones. Fat droplets are usually tiny, these little black so, uh, circles that you see. And they are going to be embedded within those thylakoid space in that, ex, uh, in that extra space within the chloroplast readily available in case they are needed by, our, uh, by the cells. So here, sugar production is going to be a multi-step process, right? You have the light coming in and the light reactions to create those high energy molecules in the form of NADPH and ATP. Those are then going to be utilized in the carbon fixation cycle to create our sugars which are um, also the starch is going to be providing the sugar as well. Those sugars are then broken down uh, to create either metabolites or go into the citric acid cycle in the form of pyruvates. Again, the very same way as we did before in mitochondria to produce more energy production through ADP. So in plants, you're going to see both of those things happening, both uh, side of the reaction. You have ADP production through the light energy, and then sugar production as well as the uh, energy production through mitochondria. So oxidation for phosphorylation didn't just happen overnight. It probably evolved in stages because very early organisms produced just ATP by fermentation because there wasn't any atmospheric oxygen or not enough atmospheric oxygen was present at that time. Uh, at that time, the organic acids would have just been in the environment lowering your pH so they would have pumped protons out of the cells using ATP. Um, and the next stage, you started to produce uh, 
you know, just whatever nutrition was around in that space began to disappear. So they had to somehow now save that energy as well as be able to produce it. So in that second stage is when you would have produced those ATP uh, by pumping protons from the electron transfer chain. Um, and then over time, obviously, you have those highly efficient proton pumping electron transport systems that generate the gradients uh, and allow for large amounts of ATP to, produ to be produced. So these are examples of some of those evolution of pumps. Initially, you would just have had a pump that could drive uh, you know, protons out and produce ATP in a very primitive cell. In the second step, you would have had a little bit more work. So you would have had electron transport of some type happening inside the cell to allow this proton pump to function so that it could produce ATP. And then eventually you had a coupling of those two steps to create a lot more efficient system that could drive a lot more uh, energy. So over time is not like a short period of time, right? It's evolved over billions of years. So you have looking at it at various times, you've had the first living cell happen uh, probably, you know, around 3.6 billion years old, but the first photosynthetic and aerobic respiration ha uh, didn't happen until you had enough oxygen accumulated in the system for that to be efficient. And then since then, it's been a lot faster growth of these um, organisms from that time. But that's only about 2 billion years ago. Um, now, some photosynthetic uh, bacteria do not necessarily use the same stuff as everyone else. Um, so sulfur bacteria, for example, are used to living in harsh environment because they can use some of those harsh chemicals to their advantage. So they can use hydrogen sulfide as an electron donor rather than just water. So this is one of the things that likely started, you know, something similar to that. Those organisms that were living in those harsh environments being able to metabolize those harsh uh, substances is partly how this system would have started to evolve to begin with, because they could utilize that just the protons from those hydrogen sulfides and use them in their photosystem to again just get NADPH and then eventually ATP. Another example of something like that is methanococcus um, that live in hypothermal vents and they use hydrogen gas um, that are bubbling through these vents as a way to run chemiosmotic coupling because they again have that source available and they're able to utilize it. They can survive in those uh, extreme conditions. Questions? I actually did good on time. No questions? Well, if there are no questions, then we will end class early today so you can have your early Thanksgiving break. That's good. Anyone want to talk? <laughs>